Here are 30 common mistakes that new killers make and how to avoid them to make you a better player. The last five tips on this list are the most crucial, so make sure you stick around for that. Number one, not abandoning chase. A lot of times when you get in chase with a survivor, your instinct is to just continue chasing them until you down them, but you have to understand after a certain amount of time of chasing them that you really need to just leave them and look for somebody else. If a survivor is leading you on a really, really good chase and you're not able to catch up to them, it'll be much more beneficial for you to leave them and go try to find another survivor that's out of position than to continue trying to down this one survivor. The general rule of thumb that kind of depends on the person playing is if you've been in the same chase for more than like 45 seconds to a minute, then you should try to leave that chase and chase somebody else. It's beneficial even if you don't necessarily know where somebody else is because at least the person you were chasing now has to heal or now has to go find a gen to work on or something else. Prioritizing kicking gens instead of chasing a survivor. I see this constantly. So many killers will have the perfect opportunity to go get rid of a health state of a survivor or even down them, but instead they see a gen that's really far progressed and decide to go kick it instead. Kicking gens barely does anything for you. For 20 seconds of regression, it takes survivors only five seconds to make that back up. So you're much better off getting pressure by downing a survivor or getting them injured than saving just a couple seconds on a gen. Looping the outside of TL walls. There's a structure in the game called TL walls because it's literally a T and an L and there's one window on each wall. For these structures, you never ever want to loop on the outside because it gives survivors enough time to go to the next window. If you loop on the inside, however, you're forcing the survivor into a 50-50 situation, which heavily increases your chances of downing them. Vaulting TL walls. This is like the number one rule that you never ever want to do. Vaulting TL walls is legitimately worse than looping on the outside of them, because while you vault, you can't do any mind games, the survivors still have enough time to get to the next window, and you're completely locked in place so you can't see any information in like surrounding areas or anything. So do not vault TL walls. Trying to use your power when it would be better to M1. This is a mistake that even I still make on certain killers, and it's basically trying to use your ability too much. In my opinion, this is most notable on like Trickster or Billy, for example, because you're constantly trying to throw your knives or constantly trying to use your insta down chainsaw because it feels almost like demoralizing in a sense to not use their ability and to just M1. But trust me when I say it's sometimes better to literally just hit them normally than to spend like an additional 30 seconds to a minute trying to use your power to down them. So please do not be afraid to hit people normally. Bringing perks that are good, but are less good on the killers you're using. Obviously you can bring whatever perk you want, but there's certain perks that synergize better with certain killers. For example, take the perk Save the Best for Last. Save the Best for Last is a token-based perk, so every time you perform an M1 basic attack on a survivor that's not the obsession, you gain a token up to eight tokens, and each token increases the cooldown after hitting a survivor by 5%. So once you have eight stacks, your cooldown is so fast, but if you perform a basic attack on the obsession, then you lose two stacks. So yes, this perk is really good on pretty much any killer, but it's way better on killers that have easy-to-use M2 special abilities, such as Demogorgon, with his shred or such as pig with her ambush. So just try to think about the pros and cons of each perk for the specific killer that you're using. If you're enjoying this video and want to support me so I can make better content on this channel, go check out my Patreon linked in the description below or become a channel member by clicking that blue join button. Special thanks to all of my patrons and all of my members on screen now. Going on autopilot. This happens so often for all skill levels, but the tip is literally so simple. Don't just play this game completely mindlessly and just hold W and click M1 every once in a while. If you're not trying to think through what the other person can possibly do and how you can mind game them to trick them into doing something, then you're likely not going to win unless the survivors are kind of bad. And I've started to notice that even high skilled killers are going on autopilot just because they've been playing the game for so long that they just start to kind of forget about the actual strategy of the game. Does that make sense? And this goes hand in hand with the next tip, which is not switching up your mind games. When I'm on autopilot, I fall into this trap a lot as well. If you come up to the same structure and do the same exact mind game on the same exact survivor, the survivors obviously going to expect it. Like for example, if you're on a TL wall and you loop them through the inside, so it puts them in the 50-50 situation, and then you show your red stain to make them think that you're coming, and then moonwalk back to hit them after they vault. If you do that again on the same survivor, they're obviously going to expect you to do that. So try to keep track of the mind games that you do on each specific survivor so you don't repeat them in the future. Not remembering the survivor's exhaustion perks. This is something that kind of just takes time and experience, but you always want to keep in mind which exhaustion perks every single survivor has, or if they even have any exhaustion perks at all. This is mostly important for dead hard so you don't accidentally hit them while they dead hard, but take exhaustion perks like Smash It, for example, which gives survivors a speed burst after they stun you. Obviously, if you know that they have this perk, you don't want to get stunned as much as possible. So just really try to figure out what exhaustion perks they have early and memorize them for the mid game and late game. Not keeping track of non-exhaustion perks. This is much more difficult, but you can really take advantage of it for certain perks. For example, if you know that a survivor is using self-care and every time you injure them, you see them go to the corner and heal themselves, that is a perk that you're going to want to take advantage of. 
So if you ever get in a chase with this person, hit them and then just leave because you know for a fact that they're going to spend the length of a GTA loading screen healing themselves. So it'll basically mean that you're playing a 3v1 for a majority of the match. And then of course, there's other perks that you want to be aware of, which just come with time and experience, such as Soul Guard or For the People or Borrow Time or any boon perks. Just always have room in your brain for the perks so you don't accidentally make a mistake that could have been avoided. Not keeping track of the survivor's skill level. This is very, very vital to winning a game. If you can recognize the strong link and the weak link of the four survivors, you can really take advantage of that. In general, you want to avoid chasing the stronger survivors and try to focus on chasing the weaker survivors. And doing gens is the most skillless thing possible. So any skill level of survivor can do this, which means that while the good survivor is leading you on a good chase, the weak survivors can still do gents and progress the game really quickly. However, if you're chasing the weaker survivors, the strong survivors are going to be doing gens, yes, but that's no different than the weaker survivors doing gens. However, if you're chasing a weaker survivor, you're going to be able to down them much quicker than you would with the strong survivor, which will ultimately snowball your pressure in the long run. Speaking of snowballing, slugging incorrectly. I cannot tell you how many times I see people slug incorrectly. My personal rule is that you should avoid slugging at all costs unless you know that you can build pressure in 15 to 20 seconds. A situation where you would want to slug, for example, is if the survivors are all grouped up in an area like the corner of the map or something where there's a dead zone with no pallets, because you know for a fact that you'll be able to down survivors quickly in this area. Being able to slug properly is a very, very difficult thing to teach because there's an infinite amount of situations that you could be in, but really just try to think about when you should actually slug and when you should not while you're in the game and try to learn from the outcome of each attempted slug to see whether or not you should do that in the future. Respecting pallets. This is pretty straightforward. I see a lot of killers doing anything in their power to avoid being stunned by a pallet. Being stunned really isn't that big of a deal and good survivors will take advantage of you doing this and will get another loop in and just not throw the pallet. So in general, try not to respect pallets and just walk through them as though there's no pallet there. Mind gaming on loops that survivors can see over. There are certain loops in the game where your head will stick over them and this obviously takes practice and experience from the survivor's perspective to know whether or not you can see the killer over these loops, but try to keep that in the back of your mind while you play survivor so that you know when and when to not mind game on those loops. Play to your killer's strengths. Really try to analyze what your killer's ability is and what it's good for, and then take full advantage of that. For example, Legion's power is really good for grouped up survivors. So if you see grouped up survivors, even if they're injured, still use your power because it adds a lot of slowdown and then you could just chase the last survivor that you see. For Blight, you can go at insane speed. So it's obviously much easier to get to places quicker, which pairs really well with information perks like Tinker or Barbecue or gen slowdown perks like Ruin, Call of Brine, Eruption, etc. I know that may be common sense, but a lot of people do not do this. Starting with hard to learn killers. There are certain killers that are way more straightforward to use and way easier to pick up on than other killers, such as Wraith or Legion. And there are some killers that are so difficult to use unless you really understand Dead by Daylight, like Nurse or Blight or Billy, that you're generally going to want to avoid until you get better at playing the regular killers. On Starve, I made a really good guide on which killers you should play first, and I'll link that in the description below. Not waiting for Dead Hard. This is extremely simple. If you know a survivor has Dead Hard, just wait an extra second or two before swinging so you can bait out their Dead Hard. Getting 360. This is very similar. If a survivor is trying to 360 you, you can literally just stop what you're doing, don't move, and then once they're in front of you, then swing. If you try to swing on a 360 survivor and you're not able to track them with your camera, you're going to miss and it's going to be really embarrassing. <laughs> so don't do that. Looping pallets the wrong way. If there's ever a regular pallet loop, you always want to loop the survivor in a direction that'll put them in the worst spot possible when they throw the pallet. For example, if there's a pallet loop on the edge of the map, chase them so that once they throw the pallet, they are on the side closest to the edge of the map so that when you kick the pallet, they're kind of trapped back there and then they don't gain as much distance. And this goes hand in hand with my next tip, which is breaking pallets in the wrong direction. This is just if you're looping the survivor around a downed pallet and you finally give up to break that pallet. Don't break it if you're on the side of the edge of the map. Break it in a way to where they lose the most amount of distance possible. Let's take the edge loop again. If you break the pallet while you're closest to the edge of the map, the survivor has plenty of time to make it to another loop. But if you break it on the side where you're closer to the center of the map, then the survivor barely gains any distance. Breaking the wrong breakable doors. This comes with practice and experience, but there's certain breakable doors that you don't want to break because it's either a waste of your time or it'll open up extremely good loops for survivor. Like there's a door on the top story of the Dead Dog Saloon that you almost never want to break because it opens up basically an infinite loop for the survivor. And there's also other doors on Wretched Shop where it literally creates a dead end for the survivor. So there's no point in breaking that door or else they have an escape route. So please do not break every single door that you see. Prioritizing kicking boon totems in chase. I see this so often. If there's a boon totem and you're chasing a survivor, finish the chase with the survivor before you break that boon. Otherwise, you're giving them a free opportunity to gain a lot of distance on you. Not recognizing infinites. I hate to say it, but there are some loops on some maps against some killers that are basically infinites and 
you'll never be able to catch up to the survivor. So if you can recognize these loops before you actually chase a survivor there, then you know which areas to avoid as much as possible. If a survivor runs to that loop, you can just ignore them and not chase them because it'll be a waste of your time. Not body blocking windows or pallets. Just use your body to block pallets or windows if a survivor makes a mistake. Simple as that, it'll just stop their brain from working and you'll get a free down. Patrolling gens that are hard to get to to begin with. A lot of times when I'm playing killer, I'll just completely ignore gens that I just don't like going to. For example, the generator on the top of the story of Dead Dog Saloon. To get to that gen on a killer that can't teleport, you have to go inside the Dead Dog Saloon, go up the stairs, and all the way around that wall before you can get up there. It takes like at least 10 to 20 seconds, and it's a complete waste of your time. So literally just ignore that gen and focus on the gens that are really easy to get to, because you can use those extra seconds you spent trying to get to the annoying gen to apply pressure to other people. Okay, we're on the five most important mistakes to fix. If you made it this far, go drop a like and put an animal emoji in the comments below. Using Lightborn, Noed, and Franklin's as crutch perks. Now hear me out. I'm not a survivor main telling you to not use these perks because I don't like them. I am in fact a killer main, and I think these perks really slow down your ability to get better at killer. Take Lightborn, for example. Lightborn is not only detrimental to yourself, but it also doesn't force you to learn how to counter flashlights, which are some of the easiest things to counter in the game. If you rely on getting kills with Noed, then you're not really improving at the early game and the mid game. And if you can't handle items, so you bring Franklin's, you're not going to get better at constantly applying pressure. So just try to not use these perks as much as possible. And I assure you that you will get better at killer much quicker. Camping and tunneling. This is a huge mistake that new killers make because it's one of the easiest things to do. For one, if you're camping and tunneling, you're not really learning how to get better at the game in general. But two, there are so many different things to mitigate these tactics as much as possible, especially in the recent updates that behavior has been adding to this game, such as the new perk reassurance, which completely counters camping. A survivor can essentially pause the person on the hook and give them an additional 30 seconds on the hook, which can also be stacked with other survivors' reassurance. So a survivor can have an extra minute and a half per hook stage. So if you camp survivors and not apply pressure anywhere else, then the rest of the team is just going to rush gens, and then you might lose, or you might just secure the kill of that one person on the hook. But generally, in this day and age, camping is not worth it unless you're in an endgame situation. And for hardcore tunneling, if you're only going after one person to try to get them out of the game as fast as possible, this is still a really strong tactic if the survivor survivor's not good. If the survivors are good and they have anti-tunneling perks and they have teammates who will body block for them and they're really good in chase, you're going to throw the entire match trying to get this person out. So try to not camp and not tunnel unless you're in a really specific situation where it would actually be beneficial for you. Not keeping a three gen. If you're losing miserably or using a trap killer like Hack or Trapper, patrolling only three generators on the map that are extremely close to each other is your best option for making a comeback. Because it's much easier to patrol three gens that are close to each other than two gens that are close to each other and another gen on the complete opposite side of the map. So if you recognize that you're doing really poorly in a match, make sure you find three generators that you can kind of stick to the area in and keep those up as much as possible. This is a really important one, not watching content creators. Watching content creators will make you way better at killer because it'll show you so many little tiny things where you'll be like, oh, that was so smart. Why don't I do that? I can promise you this happens so often when you watch a really good killer. And there's a lot of educational content creators out there who will tell you why they're doing a certain thing in this certain moment, which can really help you get better at killer. And lastly, the most common mistake that pretty much everybody makes is getting frustrated with toxicity and throwing the game because of it. If there are survivors who are teabagging, if there are survivors who are flashlight clicking, if there are survivors that are head-on stunning you, do not let these things frustrate you because it'll make you tilted and then you'll perform way worse. Pretty much anything that you may consider toxic is actually helping you. For example, if a survivor stuns you at a pallet and then they teabag, they're losing distance that they could have gotten if they just continued running. Survivors that click their flashlight are also losing distance, making it easier for you to get closer to them. Survivors that emote after vaulting a window or vaulting a pallet are, again, losing distance that they could have gotten otherwise. These people are purposely trying to get on your nerves so that you perform worse. So if you don't let them anger you, you're going to actually have a better match overall. If you're interested in getting better at every single killer in Dead by Daylight, go click on this video right here. It'll be extremely helpful for you.